Hi, and welcome to this year's annual Wikibon predictions. This is our 2018 version. Last year, uh, we had a very successful webinar describing what we thought was going to happen in 2008 or 2017 and beyond, and we've assembled a team to do the same thing again this year. I'm very excited to be joined uh, for the, with the, by the folks listed here on the screen. My name is Peter Burris, uh, but with me is David Floyer, Jim Kabilis is remote, George Gilbert's here in our Palo Alto studio with me. Neil Radin is remote. David Volante is here in the studio with me. And Stuart Miniman is back in our Marlboro office. So thank you analysts for attending and uh, we look forward to a great teleconference today. Now what we're going to do over the course of the next 45 minutes or so is we're going to hit about 13 of the 22 predictions that we have for the coming year. So if you have additional questions, I want to reinforce this. If you have additional questions or things that don't get answered, if you're a client, give us a call, reach out to us, we'll leave you with the contact information at the end of the session. Uh, but to start things off, we just want to make sure that everybody understands where we're coming from and let you know who is Wikibon. So Wikibon is a company that starts with the idea of what's important is to research communities. Communities are where the action is, community is where the change is happening, and communities where the trends are being established. And so we use digital technologies like the Cube, CrowdChat, and others to really ensure that we are surfacing the best ideas that are in a community and making them available to our clients so that they can succeed more successful, they can be more successful in their endeavors. When we do that, we're, our focus has always been on a very simple premise. And that is that we're moving to an era of digital business. For many people, digital business can mean virtually anything. For us, it means something very specific. To us, the difference between business and digital business is data. A digital business uses data to differentially create and keep a customer. So borrowing from what Peter Drucker said, if, that's, if a, the goal of business is to uh, create customers and keep and sustain customers, the goal of dig digital business is to use data to do that. And that's going to inform an enormous number of conversations, an enormous number of decisions and strategies over the next few years. We specifically believe that all businesses are going to have to establish what we regard as the five core digital business capabilities. First, they're going to have to put in place concrete approaches to turning more data into work. It's not enough to just accrete data, to, uh, to capture data, or to move data around. You have to be very purposeful and planful in how you establish the means by which you turn that data into work so that you can create and keep more customers. Secondly, it's absolutely essential that we build kind of the three core technology issues here, technology capabilities, of effectively doing a better job of capturing data and IOT and people, or Internet of Things and people, mobile computing for example, is going to be a crucial feature of that. You have to then, once you capture that data, turn it into value. And we think this is the essence of what big data, and in many respects, AI is going to be all about. And then once you have the possibility, kind of the potential energy of that data in place, then you have to turn it into kinetic energy and generate work in your business through what we call systems of agency. Now all of this is made possible by this significant transformation that happens to be conterminous with this transition to digital business, and that is the emergence of the cloud. The technology industry has always been defined by the problems it was able to solve, catalyzed by the characteristics of the technology that made it possible to solve them. And cloud is a, crucial to almost all of the new types of problems that we're going to solve. So these are the five digital business capabilities that we're going to talk about, where we're going to have our predictions. Let's start, first and foremost, with this notion of turn more data into work. So our first prediction relates to how data governance is likely to change on a global, global basis. If we, if we believe that we need to turn more data into work, well, businesses haven't generally adopted many of the principles associated with those practices. They haven't optimized to do that better. They haven't elevated those concepts within the business as broadly and successfully as they have, or as they should. We think that's going to change in part by the emergence of GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation. It's going to go in full effect in May, to, uh, May 2018, a lot, of, a lot has been written about it, a lot has been talked about, but our core issues ultimately are is that the, met, the, the dictates associated with D GDPR are going to elevate the conversation on a global basis. 
And it mandates something that's now called the Data Protection Officer. We're going to talk about that in a second, Dave Vellante. But it is going to have real teeth. So we were talking with one Chief Privacy Officer not too long ago who suggested that had the uh, Equifax breach occurred under the rules of GDPR, that the actual fines that would have been levied would have been in excess of $160 billion, which is a little bit more than the zero dollars that has, has been fined thus far. Now we've seen new bills introduced in Congress, but ultimately our observation and our conversations with a lot of data chief privacy officers or data protection officers is that in the B2B world, GDPR is going to strongly influence not just how businesses behave regarding data in Europe, but on a global basis. Now that has an enormous implication, Dave Vellante, because it certainly suggests this notion of a data protection officer is something now we've got another potential chief here. How do we think that's going to organize itself over the course of the next few years? Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, there are a lot of chiefs in the house, uh, and sometimes it gets confusing. You know, there's the CIO, uh, there's the CDO, and, and that's either either chief digital officer or chief chief data officer. There's the CSO, could be strategy. Sometimes that could be security. There's the CPO, is that privacy or, or product. As I say, it gets confusing sometimes. On theCUBE, we talk to all of these roles, so we wanted to try to add some, some clarity uh, to that. First thing uh, we want to say is the, the CIO, the chief information officer, that role is not going away. A lot of people predict that, we think that's, that's nonsense. Uh, they will continue to have a critical role. Digital transformations are the priority in, in organizations, and so the chief digital officer is evolving from more than just a strategy role to much more of an operational role. Generally speaking, these chiefs tend to report, in our ob observation, to the chief operating officer, president, COO, and we see the chief digital officer as increasing operational responsibility, aligning with this, the COO and, and, and getting incremental uh, responsibility that's more operational in nature. So the prediction really is that the, the chief digital officer is going to emerge as a, a charismatic leader uh, amongst these chiefs. And by 2022, nearly 50% of organizations will position the chief digital officer in a more prominent role than the CIO, the CISO, the, the CDO, and the CPO. Those will still be critical roles. The CIO will be an enabler, the, the chief information security officer has a huge role obviously to play, uh, especially in terms of making security a team sport and not just falling on, on, on IT's shoulders or the security team's shoulders. The chief data officer, who really emerged from a records and data management role in many cases, particularly within regulated industries, will still be responsible for that data architecture and, and data access, uh, working very closely with the emerging chief privacy officer and maybe even the chief data protection officer. Those roles will be, will be pretty closely aligned. Um, so again, these roles remain critical, but the, the chief digital officer we see as increasing in prominence. Great, thank you very much, Dave. And so when we think about these two activities, what we're really describing is over the course of the next few years, we strongly believe that data will be regarded more as an asset within business and we'll see resources devoted to it and we'll see uh, certainly management devoted to it. Now, that leads to the next set of questions. As data becomes an asset, the pressure to acquire data becomes that much more acute. We believe strongly that IOT has an enormous implication longer term as a basis for thinking about how data gets acquired. Now, operational technology has been in place for a long time. We're not limiting ourselves just to operational technology when we talk about this. We're really talking about the full range of devices that are going to provide and extend information and digital services out to consumers, out to the edge, out to a number of other places. So, let's start here. Neil Radin, when we start talking about this notion of how uh, the edge is going to have an impact in thinking about biz digital business design, uh, what are we really talking about? How are, what are going to be some of the key, key issues that really define those network choices? Neil, are you on mute? All right, I'll jump in and take this one. So, if we can go back to this slide. 
We believe very strongly, ultimately, that the, uh, over the course of the next few years, the uh, edge analytics are going to be an increasingly important feature overall of how technology decisions get made, how technology or digital business gets conceived, and even ultimately how business gets defined. Now, Dave Floyer has done a significant amount of work in this domain, and we've provided that key finding on the right-hand side. And what it shows is that if you take a look at an edge-based application, a stylized edge-based application, and you presume that all the data moves back to a centralized cloud, you're going to increase your costs dramatically over a three-year period. Now that moderates the idea, or moderates the need ultimately for providing a, an approach to bringing greater autonomy, greater intelligence down to the edge itself. And we think that ultimately, IOT and edge analytics become increasingly synonymous. The challenge though is that as we evolve, while this has a pressure to keep more of the data at the edge, that ultimately a lot of the data exhaust can someday become regarded as valuable data. And so as a consequence of that, there's still a countervailing pressure to try to still move all data, not at the moment of automation, but for modeling and integration purposes, back to some other location. The thing that's going to determine that is going to be the rate at which the cost of moving the data around go down. And our expectation is that over the next few years, when we think about the implications of some of the big cloud suppliers, Amazon, Google, others, that are building out significant networks to facilitate their business services, may in fact have a greater impact on the common carriers, or as great an impact on the common carriers as they have on, on any server or other infrastructure company. So our prediction over the next few years is, watch what Amazon, watch what Google do as they try to drive costs down inside their networks because that will have an impact on how much data moves from the edge back to the cloud. It won't have an impact necessarily on the need for automation at the edge because latency doesn't change, but it will have a cost impact. Now that leads to a second consideration, and the second consideration is ultimately that when we talk about greater autonomy at the edge, we need to think about how that's going to play out. Jim Kabilis, can you? You have to search for Jim and unmute him. <laughs> really? <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Jim Kabilis, why don't you, uh, gracious, I apologize everybody, we're having an issue here. Here we go. Jim. There you go, Jim. Hey, thanks a lot, Peter. Um, little glitch there, Neil is also available. Um, yeah, so what we're seeing in Wikibon is that um, more and more of the AI application, more and more of the application development involves AI, and more and more of the AI involves deployment of those models, deep learning, machine learning, and so forth, to the edges of the Internet of Things and people. Uh, and much of that uh, AI will be operating autonomously mm -hmm. with little or no uh, uh, round tripping back to the cloud. Um, what, that co what that's causing, um, in fact, what we're seeing uh, really about, uh, about a quarter of the AI development projects in 2018 will involve autonomous edge deployment. What that involves is that more and more of that AI will be, be uh, those applications will be bespoke. They'll be one of a kind or unique or unprecedented mm -hmm. application. And uh, what, that's, what that means is that, um, you know, there's a lot of different deployment scenarios within which um, uh, organizations will need to uh, use new forms of, of uh, learning uh, to be able to ready the, a, those AI applications to do their jobs effectively, be it doing prediction or real-time uh, guiding of an autonomous vehicle and so forth, reinforcement learning. Um, is the core of, uh, of many of these kinds of projects, especially those that involve robotics. So really software is eating the world and you know the biggest bites are being taken at the edge and much of that is AI, much of that is autonomous, where there is uh, no need or less need for real-time latency. You know, you need adaptive uh, components, uh, AI-infused components at the edge that can learn by doing from environmental variables and can adapt their own algorithms to, to, to take the right action. So they'll have far-reaching impacts on application development in 2018, 
for the developer, uh, the new developer really is a data scientist at heart. They're going to have to uh, tap into um, a new range of sources of data, especially edge source data from the sensors on those devices. They're going to need to do types of training and testing, especially reinforcement learning, which is uh, doesn't involve training data so much as involves uh, being able to build an, uh, an algorithm that can learn to maximize what's called a cumulative reward function. Um, and to do the training that they're adaptively in real time at the edge and so forth and so on. So really, you know, much of this will be bespoke um, in the sense that every edge device increasingly will have its own set of parameters and its own set of objective functions that will need to be uh, optimized. Um, so that's one of the uh, the leading edge uh, uh, forces, trends in uh, in development we see in the coming year. Back to you, Peter. Excellent, Jim. Thank you very much. We're going to find out now if I've successfully unmuted everybody by going on to the next question here is, how are you going to create value from data? So once you've, we've gone through a couple trends, we have uh, multiple others about what's going to happen at the edge, but as we think about how we're going to create value from data, Neil Radin, have we successfully unmuted you? I'm here, thank you. There you go. Um, oh boy, you know, the problem is that, that data science emerged rapidly out of sort of a perfect storm of, of, of big data and cloud computing and so forth. Um, and, and people who had been involved in quantitative methods, uh, you know, rapidly uh, glommed onto the title because it was, let's face it, it was very glamorous and, and paid very well. Uh, but there weren't really good um, uh, best practices. So what we have in data science is a pretty wide um, uh, uh, field of, of things that are called data science. My opinion is that uh, the, the true data scientists are people who are scientists and are involved in developing new or improving algorithms as opposed to prepping data and applying models. Uh, so the whole field really uh, kind of generated very quickly. It really just in a few years. Uh, to me, I called it you know generation zero, which was more like uh, data prep and model management all done manually. Uh, and it wasn't really sustainable in most organizations because for obvious reasons. So uh, generation uh, one, then some uh, vendors stepped up with toolkits or benchmarks or whatever for data scientists and made it a, a, a little better. And generation two is what we're going to see in 2018 is uh, the need for uh, data scientists to no longer prep data or at least not spend very much time with it um, and not to do model management because the software will not only manage the progression of the models but even recommend them uh, and generate them and select the data and so forth. So it's, it's, it's in for a very big change and I think what you're going to see is that the ranks of data scientists are going to sort of bifurcate to old style, let me sit down and, and write some spaghetti code in R or Java or something, and those that use these advanced toolkits to really get the work done. That's great, Neil. And of course, when we start talking about getting the work done, uh, we are becoming increasingly dependent upon tools, aren't we, George? But the tool marketplace for data science uh, for big data has been somewhat fragmented and fractured and hasn't necessarily focused on solving uh, the problems of the data scientists, but in many respects focusing the problems that the tools themselves have. What's going to happen in the coming year when we start thinking about Neil's prescription that as the tools improve, what's going to happen to the tools? Okay, so um, the big thing that, that we see supporting um, what Neil's talking about that there's the, that's a what what Neil was talking about is is partly a symptom of a a product issue and a go to market issue, where the product issue was we had a lot of uh, best of breed products that weren't all designed to fit together. Um, that's uh, that in the in the broader big data space that's the same issue that we faced with more narrowly with on prem Hadoop, where you know we were trying to fit together a bunch of open source packages um, that had an admin and developer burden. Um, more broadly, um, what, what um, Neil is talking about is uh, sort of richer end-to-end um, uh, -end tools that handle both everything from the ingest all the way to the operationalization and feedback of the models. Um, but part of, um, part of what has to go on here is that um, 
with open source, uh, these open source tools, the price points and the functional footprints that many of the vendors are, are supporting right now um, can't feed an enterprise sales force. Everyone talks with their open source business models about land and expand and inside sales. Um, but the problem is once you want to go to wide, wide de deployment in an enterprise, you still need um, someone uh, negotiating commercial terms at a senior level. You still need um, the technical people fitting um, the tools into a broader architecture. And most of the vendors that we have who are uh, open source vendors today don't have either the product breadth or the, uh, the deal size uh, to support uh, traditional enterprise software uh, account team which typically had a million and a half to two million um, um, quota every year. So we see consolidation and the consolidation again driven by uh, the need for simplicity for the admins and the developers and for business uh, business model reasons to support enterprise sales force. All right, so what we're going to see happen in the course of the coming year is a lot of specialization and recognition of what is data science, what are the practices, how is it going to work, supported by an increasing quality of tools and a lot of tool vendors are going to be left behind. Now, the third kind of notion here for those core technology capabilities is we still have to enact based on data. The good news is that big data is starting to show some returns, in part because of some of the things that AI and other technologies are capable of doing, uh, but we have to move beyond just creating the potential for work, we have to turn that into work. And that's what we mean ultimately by this notion of systems of agency. The idea that data-driven applications will increasingly be act on behalf of a brand, on behalf of a company, and building those systems out is going to be crucial. It's going to have a whole new set of disciplines and expertise required. So when we think about what's going to be required, it always starts with this notion of AI. A lot of folks, are presuming, however, that AI is going to be relatively easy to build or relatively easy to put together. We have a different opinion, George. What do we think is going to happen as these next few years unfold related to AI adoption in large enterprises? Okay, so um, let's go back to the lessons we learned from the sort of the big data, the raw, you know, let's put a data lake in place, which was sort of the top of everyone's agenda for several years. Um, the expectation was it was going to um, cure cancer, taste like chocolate, and cost a dollar. And uh, <laughs> it didn't quite work out that way, partly because we had a burden on the administrator, again, of so many tools that weren't all designed to fit together, even though they were distributed together. Um, and then the data scientists, the guys who had to take all this data that wasn't carefully uh, curated yet, and turn that into um, advanced analytics and, and, uh, and uh, machine learning models. We have many of the same problems now with the tool sets that are, um, that are becoming more integrated but at, the, at lower levels. This is partly what um, Neil Radin was just talking about. What we have to recognize is something that we've seen all along, I mean, since the beginning of, of uh, <laughs> corporate computing, we have different levels of abstraction. And they're, you know, at the very bottom, when you're dealing with things like TensorFlow um, or MXNet, that's for, that's not for mainstream enterprises. That's for, you know, the big sophisticated tech companies who are building new algorithms um, on those frameworks. Um, there's a level above that um, where you're using like uh, a Spark cluster in the machine learning built into that um, that's slightly more accessible, but when we when we talk about mainstream enterprises taking advantage of um, AI, the 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 low hanging fruit is for them to use the um, pre trained models that the public cloud vendors have created with all the consumer data on speech, image recognition, natural language processing. And then some of those them, some of those capabilities can be further combined into applications um, like uh, managing a contact center, and we'll see more 
uh, from like Amazon, like recommendation engines, uh, fulfillment optimization, pricing optimization. So our expectation yeah. ultimately, George, is that we're going to see a lot of this, a lot of AI adoption happen through existing applications because the uh, vendors that are capable of acquiring the talent, taking, you know, experimenting, creating value, uh, software vendors are going to be where a lot of the talent ends up. So Neil, uh, we have an example of that. Give us an example of what we think is going to happen in 2018 when we start thinking about exploiting AI in applications. Neil's on mute again. Let me see if I can unmute him. All right, Neil, are you there? One more time. Didn't get him. Come on. All right, Neil. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that uh, I think it's it, it's fairly clear that the the application of let's call it advanced analytics and data science and and even machine learning um, they're really. Uh, it, it, rapidly becoming a, a commonplace in organizations, not just at the, at, at the bottom of, uh, of the triangle here. But I like the example of salesforce.com. What they've done with Einstein is they've made uh, machine learning and I guess you could say AI applications available to their customer base. And, and, and why is that a good thing? Because their customer base already has uh, a giant database of, of clean data that they can use. So you're going to see a huge number of applications being built with Einstein against Salesforce.com data. But there's another thing to consider, and that is a long time ago, Salesforce.com built connectors to a zillion kinds of external data. So if you're a Salesforce.com customer using Einstein, you're going to be able to use those advanced tools without knowing anything about how to train a machine learning model and start to build those things. Um, and I think that they're going to lead the industry uh, in that sense. That's going to push their revenue next year to, I don't know, $11 billion or $12 billion. Great, thanks Neil. All right, so when we think about further evidence of this and further impacts, we ultimately have to consider some of the challenges associated with how we're going to create application value continually uh, from these tooling. And that leads to the idea that one of the cobbler's children that's going to gain or benefit from AI will in fact be the development organization. Jim, what's our prediction for how uh, auto programming impacts development? He's on mute. Get on mute. Just a second, Jim. All right, Jim. Thank you very much, Peter. Yeah, automation, wow. Auto programming, like I said, is the uh, centerpiece of enterprise application development go going forward. We don't believe it as code generation, but that really understates the, the power of uh, auto programming as it's evolving. Um, within 2018, what we're going to see is that machine learning driven code generation approaches will come to the forefront of innovation. We're seeing a lot of activity in the industry and it's uh, institutions and so forth to use ML to drive uh, the productivity of developers for all kinds of applications. We're also seeing a fair amount of what's called RPA, robotic process automation. And really what's, how they differ is that ML will, will deliver or will drive code generation from what I call the inside out, meaning creating reams of code that are geared to and optimized for particular application scenario versus RPA, which really takes sort of an outside in uh, approach, which is essentially, it's uh, the evolution of screen scraping that is able to infer the underlying uh, code needed for uh, applications of various sorts from the external artifacts, the screens and uh, the from sort of the flow of interactions and clicks and so forth for a given application. Um, what we're going to see is that ML and RPA will complement each other in the next generation of auto programming capabilities. Um, and so, you know, really application development tedium is really the, the enemy of, of, of one of the enemies of productivity for some of them. This is a lot of work, very uh, detailed, pain, painstaking work. And what they need is they need better, more nuanced, and um, more adaptive auto programming tools to be able to, to build 
the uh, the codes uh, code at the uh, the pace that's absolutely necessary for this new environment of, of cloud computing. So really, AI related technologies can be applied and are being applied to application development productivity challenges of all sorts. AI is fundamental to RPA as well. We're seeing a fair number of the vendors in that space incorporate ML driven. Um, OCR and natural language processing and screen scraping and so forth into their core uh, tools to be able to quickly uh, build up um, the logic needed to drive um, sort of the very much outside in automation of fairly complex orchestration scenario. In 2018, we'll see more of the, these technologies come together, but you know they're not a silver bullet. Because fundamentally, um, and for uh, organizations that are considering going deeply down into auto programming, they're going to have to factor AI into their overall plans. They need to get knowledgeable about AI. They're going to need to bring more AI specialists into their, their core development teams to be able to select from the growing range of tools that are out there, RPA and ML-driven auto programming. But you know, really what we're seeing is that the AI, the data scientist who's been you know, the fundamental developer of AI, uh, they're coming into, into the core of, of development tools and, uh, and skills and organizations. And uh, they're going to be fundamental to this whole, uh, this whole trend in 2018 and beyond. As AI gets proven out in auto programming, these developers um, will then be able to evangelize the, the, the core utility of, of this technology, AI in a variety of other back-end but critically important uh, uh, investments that organizations will be making in 2018 and beyond, especially in IT operations and management. AI is big in that area as well. Back to you there, Peter. Yeah, we'll come to that a little bit later in the presentation, Jim. That's a crucial point. But the other thing we want to note here regarding ultimately how uh, folks will create value out of these technologies is to consider the simple question of okay, how much will developers need to know about infrastructure? And one of the big things we see happening is this notion of serverless. And here we've called it serverless developer more. Jim, why don't you take us through why we think serverless is going to have a significant impact on the industry, at least, it's certainly from a developer perspective and developer productivity perspective. Yeah, I think serverless is really um, having a big pack already and has for the last several years now. Now, everybody, many of you are familiar in the development world with AWS, AWS Lambda, which is really the, the, uh, the groundbreaking public cloud service that incorporates uh, uh, the serverless capabilities, which essentially is an abstraction layer that enables developers to build event-driven stateless code that executes in a cloud environment without having to worry about, and to build microservices, without having to worry about the underlying management of containers and virtual machines and so forth. So in many ways, you know, serverless is a simplification of, uh, strategy for developers. They don't have to worry about the underlying plumbing. They can worry, they need to worry about the code, of course. The, what are called Lambda functions or functional methods and so forth. Now, functional programming has been around for quite a while, but now it's coming to the fore in this new era of serverless environments. Uh, what we're seeing in 2018 is that um, we're, we're predicting is that more than 50% of new microservices deployed in the public cloud will be deployed in serverless environments. There's AWS and Microsoft has Azure functions. IBM has their own. Google has their own. There's a variety of private, uh, there's a variety of open source cloud uh, 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 code bases for private deployment of serverless environments that we're seeing uh, evolving and beginning to mature in 2018. They all involve functional programming, which really, it, it, along, you know, when, when coupled with serverless uh, uh, you know, clouds, enables greater scale and speed in terms of development. And it's very agile friendly in the sense that you can quickly gin up a, um, a, a functionally programmed serverless uh, microservice in a hurry without having to manage state and so forth. And it's very DevOps friendly um, in, in the very real sense that it's far faster than uh, be having to build and manage and tune uh, you know, containers and VMs and so forth. So it can uh, enable a more of a real time and rapid um, and iterative uh, development uh, uh, pipeline uh, going forward in cloud computing. And really, fundamentally, what serverless is uh, doing uh, is that it's pushing more of these Lambda functions at it, uh, to the edge, to the edges. If you were at AWS reInvent 
uh, last week or the week before. Um, but you notice that AWS is putting a big push on uh, putting Lambda functions at the edge end devices for the IoT. I think we're going to see in 2018 pretty much the entire cloud arena, everybody will push more of the serverless and functional programming to the edge devices. Uh, it's just a simplification strategy that actually uh, is, is a powerful tool for, for speeding up sort of the development metabolism. All right, so Jim, let me jump in here and say that we've now introduced the uh, some of these benefits and really highlighted the role that the cloud's going to play. So let's turn our attention to this question of cloud optimization. And Stu, I'm going to ask you to start us off by talking about uh, what we mean by true private cloud and ultimately our prediction for private cloud. Do we have, uh, do we have, uh, why don't you take us through what we think is going to happen in this world of uh, true private cloud? Sure, Peter, uh, thanks a lot. So uh, when, when Wikibon, when we launched the true private cloud terminology, which was about two weeks ago, next week, two years ago, uh, next week, um, it was in, in some ways coming together of a lot of trends, similar to things that you know George and Neil and James have been talking about. So uh, it, it is nothing new to say that we needed to simplify uh, the IT stack. We all know, uh, you know the, the, the tried and true discussion of you know, way too much of the budget is spent kind of keeping the lights on, uh, what we'd like to say is kind of running the business. Um, if, if you squint through uh, the, the, this beautiful chart that we have on here, a big piece of this is operational staffing is where we need to be able to make a significant change. And what we've been uh, really excited and was what uh, led us to uh, this initial uh, you know, market segment and what we're continuing to see good growth on is the move from traditional, really siloed infrastructure to uh, you want to have you know infrastructure where it is software based. Uh, you want IT to really be able to focus on the applications and services that that they are running. And what our focus uh, for this year for the 2018 is, of course, it's it's the central point. It's the data that matters here. The whole reason we have infrastructure is to be able to run applications. And one of the things that is a key determiner as to where and what I use is the data, and how can I not only store that data, but actually gain value from that data, something we, we've, we've talked about time and again, uh, and that is a you know, major determining factor as to am I building this in a public cloud or am I doing it uh, in you know, my core? Is it something that's going to live on the edge? Uh, so that's what we were saying here with the, with the true private cloud, is not only are we going to simplify our environment and therefore uh, it, it's really the operational model uh, that we talked about. So uh, we often say the line, cloud is not a destination, uh, but it's an operational model. So true private cloud giving me some of the you know, feel uh, and management type of capability uh, that I had had in the public cloud. It's, as I said, not just virtualization, it's much more than that, but how can I start getting services? Uh, and uh, one of the extensions is true private cloud does not live in isolation. When we have kind of the core public cloud and edge deployments, uh, I need to think about the operational models, where data lives, what processing happens in each of these environments, and what data we'll need to move uh, between them. And of course, there's fundamental laws of physics that we need to uh, consider in that. So. Uh, the, the prediction, of course, is that you know we know how much gear and focus has been on the traditional data center, uh, and true private cloud uh, helps that transformation to modernization. And a big focus is many of these applications we've been talking about and uses of data set are starting to come into these true private cloud environments. So, uh, you know, we've had discussions of, of Spark. Uh, there's modern databases. Uh, many of these, there's going to be many reasons why they might live in the private cloud environment. Um, and therefore, that's something that we're going to see tremendous growth and a lot of focus. And we're seeing a, uh, a, a new wave of uh, companies that are focusing on this to deliver solutions um, that will do more than just a step function for infrastructure or get us outside of our silos, but really help us uh, deliver on those cloud native applications um, where uh, we, we pull in things like what Jim was talking about uh, with, with serverless and the like. All right, so Stu, what that suggests ultimately is that data is going to dictate that everything's not going to end up in the private or in the public cloud or centralized public clouds because of latency cost, data governance, and IP protection reasons. And there will be some others. At bare minimum, that means that we're going to have it in most large enterprises at least a couple of clouds. 
Talk to us about what this impact of multi-cloud is going to look like over the course of the next few years. Yeah, a, a, a critical point there, Peter, because, right, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, we, we, we don't have one solution. There, there's nobody that we run into that says, oh, you know, I, I just do a single, uh, you know, one environment. Uh, you know, it'd be great if we only had one application to worry about. But uh, as uh, you've done this lovely diagram here, uh, we all use lots of SaaS. And increasingly, uh, you know, Oracle, Microsoft, Salesforce, uh, you know, all, all pushing everybody to multiple SaaS environments that has major impacts on my security and where my data lives. Uh, public cloud, you know, no doubt is growing at, you know, leaps and bounds. And many customers are choosing applications uh, to live in different places. So just as in, in data centers, I would kind of look at it from an application standpoint and build up what I need. Often there's, you know, Amazon doing phenomenal, uh, but, uh, you know, maybe there's things that I'm doing with Azure. Maybe there's things that I'm doing with, with Google or others, as well as my service providers for locality, uh, for, you know, specialized services, uh, that there's reasons why people are doing it. And what customers would love is an operational model that can actually span between those. Uh, so we are very early in trying to attack this multi-cloud environment. There's everything from licensing uh, to security uh, to you know just operationally, how do I manage those? And a piece of them uh, that we were touching on in, in this prediction here um, is Kubernetes actually can be a key enabler uh, for that cloud native environment. Uh, as Jim talked about uh, with serverless, what we'd really like is our developer uh, to be able to focus on building their application and not think as much about the underlying infrastructure, whether that be you know a rack of servers that I built myself or public cloud infrastructure. So we really want to think uh, more, it's at the data and application level, it's, it's SaaS and PaaS uh, is the model and Kubernetes uh, holds the promise to solve a piece of this puzzle. Now, Kubernetes is not and by no means a silver bullet for everything that we need, but it absolutely is doing very well. Uh, our team was at the, the uh, Linux, uh, the, uh, the CNCF show, uh, KubeCon uh, last week, um, and there is you know broad adoption uh, from uh, over 40 of the leading providers, including Amazon is now a piece, even Salesforce signed up uh, to the CNCF. Uh, so Kubernetes is allowing me to be able to manage multi-cloud workflows, uh, and therefore the prediction we have here, Peter, is that 60% of developing teams will be building, sustaining multi-cloud um, with Kubernetes as a foundational component of that. That's excellent, Stu, but when we think about it, the hardware technologies, especially because of the opportunities associated with true private cloud, the hardware technologies are also going to evolve. There will be enough money here to sustain that investment. David Floyer, we do see another architecture on the horizon where for certain classes of workloads, we will be able to collapse and replicate many of these things in a economical, practical way uh, on premise. We call that Unigrid. NVMe is a, over fabric is a crucial feature of Unigrid. Uh, um, absolutely, so uh, NVMe uh, takes, uh, uh, sorry, NVMe over fabric or NVMe OF takes NVMe, which is out there as storage, and turns it into a system framework. Um, it's a major, major change in system architecture. Um, we, we call this Unigrid, and it's going to be a focus of our research in 2008. Um, early vendors are already out there. This is the fastest uh, movement from uh, early standards into products themselves. You can see on the chart that uh, IBM have come out with NVM over fabrics with the uh, nine, uh, 900 storage uh, connected to the power um, uh, nine uh, systems. Uh, NetApp have the EF750. Uh, a lot of other companies are out there. Mellanox uh, is out there looking uh, for, for, uh, for networks. Uh, High-speed networks. Accelero is Accelero uh, has a a major part of um, so, uh, of the storage software. So and it's going to be used uh, in, in in particular with things like AI. So what are the drivers and benefits of this architecture? The key is that data is the bottleneck for applications. We've talked about data. The amount of data is key to uh, uh, making applications more effective and, and higher value. 
So NVMe and NVMe over fabrics allows data to be accessed in microseconds as opposed to milliseconds. And it allows gigabytes of data per second as opposed to megabytes of data per second. And it also allows thousands of processors to access all of the data uh, in, in very, very low latencies. And that gives us amazing parallelism. So what it's about is disaggregation of storage and network and processes. There are some huge benefits from that, not least of which is that you save about 50% of the processor you get back uh, because you don't have to do storage and networking on it. Uh, you save from stranded storage, you save from uh, stranded processor and networking capabilities. So it's, overall it's going to be cheaper. But more importantly, it makes it a, a basis for delivering systems of intelligence. Um, and uh, systems of intelligence are bringing together systems of record, the traditional systems, not rewriting them, but attaching them to real-time analytics, uh, real-time um, uh, AI, and being able to blend those two systems together because you've got all of that additional data you can bring to bear on a particular problem. So systems themselves have reached pretty well the limit of human management. Uh, so one of the great benefits of, of Unigrid is to have a single metadata layer from all of that data, all of those processes. All those infrastructure elements. All those infrastructure elements. And applications. And, and, and applications themselves. So what that leads to is a huge potential to improve automation, uh, of the data center and the application of AI to uh, uh, operations, operational AI. So George, this sounds like it's going to be one of the key potential areas where we'll see AI be practically adopted within business. What do we think is going to happen here as we think about the role that AI is going to play in IT operations management? Well, if we go back to the analogy with big data that we thought was you know, going to cure cancer, it tastes like chocolate, cost a dollar. Um, and it turned out that the application, the most widespread application of big data was to take, offload ETL from expensive data warehouses. And what we expect is the first widespread application of AI embedded in applications for horizontal use, um, where Neil mentioned Salesforce, and the ability to use Einstein to access um, Salesforce data and, and connected data. Now, um, because the applications we're building are so complex, and as Stu mentioned, um, you know, we have this operational model with a true private cloud. It's actually not just the legacy stuff that's sucking up all the admin overhead. It's the complexity of the new applications and the stringency of the SLAs <laughs> means that we would have to turn millions of people into admins. The old, you know, when the telephone network started, everyone's going to have to be an operator. The only way we can get past this is if we sort of apply machine learning um, to uh, IT ops and application performance management. Um, the, key th the key here is that um, the models can learn how the um, infrastructure is laid out and how it interoperates and it can also learn about how all the application services and middleware works behaving independently and with each other and how they tie with the infrastructure. The reason that's important is because all of a sudden you can get very high fidelity root cause analysis. In the old management technology, if you had an underlying problem, you'd have a whole sort of storm of alerts because there was no reliable way to really triangulate on the, or triage the root cause. Now, what's critical is, if you have high fidelity root cause analysis, you can have really precise recommendations for remediation or automated remediation, which is something people will get comfortable with over time. That's not going to happen right away. But this is critical, um, and this is also the first large scale application of, of not just machine learning, but machine data. And so 
this topology of collecting widely disparate machine data and then applying models and then um, reconfiguring the software, it's training wheels for IoT apps where you're going to have it far more distributed and actuating devices instead of software. That's great, George. So let me sum up and then we'll take some questions. So very quickly, the action items that we have out of this overall session, and again, we have another 15 or so uh, uh, predictions that we didn't get to today. But one is, as we said, digital business is the use of data assets to compete. And so ultimately, this notion is starting to diffuse rapidly. We're seeing it on the cube, we're seeing it on the crowd chats, we're seeing it in the inquiries with our customers. Ultimately, we believe that users need to start preparing for even more business scrutiny over their technology management. For example, something very simple, and David Floyer, you and I have talked about this extensively, in our weekly action item research meeting, the idea of backing up and restoring a system, it's no longer in a digital business world, it's not just backing up and restoring a system or application, we're talking about restoring the entire business. That's going to require greater business scrutiny over technology management, it's going to lead to new organizational structures, new challenges of adopt, adopting systems, et cetera. But ultimately, our observation is that data is going to indicate technology directions across the board whether we talk about how businesses evolve and the roles that technology takes in business, or whether we talk about the key business capabilities, digital business capabilities of capturing data, turning it into value, and then turning it into work, or whether we talk about how we think about cloud architectures and which organization of cloud resources we're going to utilize. It all comes back to the role that data is going to play in helping us drive decisions. The last action item we want to put here before we get to the questions is, Con clients, if uh, we don't get to your question right now, contact us. Send us an inquiry, support at siliconangle.freshdesk.com and we'll respond to you as fast as we can over the course of the next day, two days, to try to answer your question. All right, Dave Vellante, you've been collecting some questions here. Why don't we see if we can't take uh, a couple of them before we close out? Yeah, we got about five or six minutes and in the, in the chat room, Jim Kabilis has been awesome helping out and so there's a lot of detailed answer there. The first, there's some questions and comments. The first one was, are, are there too many chiefs? Uh, and I guess, yeah, there's some title inflation. I guess my comment there would be, titles are, are cheap, results aren't. So if you're, if you're creating chief X officers just for the, to check a box, you're probably wasting money. So you got to give them you know, clear roles. But I think each of these chiefs has clear roles to the extent that they are you know, empowered. Another comment came up is, we don't want you know, Hadoop spaghetti soup all over again, with TrueDat, um, you know, we at risk of having Hadoop spaghetti soup as, as the centricity of big data moves from Hadoop to AI and ML and, and deep learning. Um, well, my answer is we are at risk of that, but that the there's customer pressure and vendor economic pressure to start consolidating. And, uh, and we'll also see what we didn't see um, in the on-prem big data era with uh, cloud vendors, they're just going to start making it easier to use uh, some of the key services together. That's just n n natural. And, I, and I'll speak for Neil on this one too, um, very quickly, that the idea ultimately is as the discipline starts to mature, we won't have people that probably aren't really capable of doing some of this data science stuff running around and buying a tool to try to supplement their knowledge and their experience. So that's going to be another factor that I think ultimately leads to clarity in how we utilize these tools as we move into an AI-oriented world. Okay, Jim is on mute, so if you wouldn't mind unmuting him. There was a question, isn't ML a more informative way of describing AI? Jim, when you and I were in, in our Boston studio, I sort of asked a similar question. AI is sort of the Uber category. Machine learning is math, deep learning is more sophisticated math. Uh, you have a detailed answer in the chat, but maybe you could give a brief summary. Sure, sure. Uh, I don't want to be too pedantic here, but deep learning is essentially more hierarchical, deeper stacks of, of neural network uh, layers to be able to infer higher level abstractions from data, you know, face recognition, sentiment analysis, and so forth. Machine learning is the broader phenomenon. That's simply a lot of different appro various approaches for distilling patterns, correlations, and outputs from the data itself. What we've seen in the last really five, six, ten years, let's say, is that um, all of the neural network approach approaches for AI have come to the forefront and are in fact the core of the marketplace and the state of the art. 
AI is an ancient paradigm that's older than probably you or me um, that began and for the longest time was rules-based systems, expert systems. Those haven't gone away. The new era of AI we see as a combination of both statistical approaches as well as rules-based approaches and possibly even orchestration-based approaches like graph models for building the broader context for AI for a variety of applications, especially distributed edge applications. Okay, thank you. And then another, another question slash comment, AI, like graphics in 1985, uh, we moved from a separate category to a core part of, of all apps, AI infused apps. Again, Jim, you have a very detailed answer in the chat room, but maybe you could give a, a summary version. Yeah, quickly enough, the most disruptive applications we see across the world, enterprise, uh, consumer, and so forth, these days involve AI, um, you know, at the heart of its machine learning, part of that neural networking. I wouldn't say that every single application is doing AI, but the ones that are really blazing the trail in terms of changing the fabric of our lives, very much, most of them have AI at their heart. That will continue as the state of the art of AI continues to advance. So really, one of the things we've been saying in our research at Wikibon is that the data scientists or those skills and tools are the nucleus of the next generation application developer, really in every sphere of our lives. Great, uh, quick comment is we will be sending out these slides to all participants, we'll be posting these slides, so thank you, uh, Kim, for that question. And very importantly, Dave, over the course of the next few days, most of our predictions docs will be posted up on Wikibon and we'll do a summary of everything that we've talked about here. So now the questions are coming through fast and furious, but let me just try to rapid fire here because we only got about a minute left. Uh, true private cloud definition, just say this, that there's a deep, we have a detailed definition that we can share, but essentially it's, it's substantially mimicking the, the, the public cloud experience on-prem. The way we like to say it is bringing the cloud operating model to your data versus trying to force fit your business in, into the cloud. So we've got detailed definitions there that frankly are evolving. Um, what about PaaS? There was a question about PaaS. I think we have a, a prediction in one of our you know, appendices predictions, but maybe a quick word on PaaS. Yeah, a very quick word on PaaS is that the, uh, there's been an enormous amount of effort put on the idea of the PaaS marketplace. Uh, Cloud Foundry, others suggested that there would be a PaaS market that would evolve because you'd want to be able to effectively have mobility and migration and portability for this large cloud application. We're not seeing that happen necessarily, but what we are seeing is that developers are increasingly <coughs> becoming a, feat, a force in dictating and driving cloud decision making, and developers will start biasing their choices to the platforms that demonstrate that they have the best developer experience. So whether we call it PaaS or whether we call it something else, providing the best developer experience is going to be really important to the future of the cloud marketplace. All right, great, and then George George O, uh, George Gilbert, you'll follow up with George O on that other question we need some clarification on. There's a question, really David, I think it's for you. Will persistent DIMMs emerge first on public clouds? Uh, almost certainly. Uh, the public clouds are where everything is going <laughs> first. And uh, when we talked about Unigrid, that's where it's going first. NVMe over fabrics, that architecture is going to be in public clouds and it has the same sort of benefits there and NVDIMs will, will again develop pretty rapidly uh, as a part of the NVMe over fabrics. Okay, we're out of time. We'll look through the, the chat and follow up with any other questions. Peter, back to you. Great, thanks very much, Dave. So once again, we want to uh, thank you everybody here that has participated in the webinar today. I apologize for, I feel like Han Solo in saying, it wasn't my fault, <laughs> but having said that, nonetheless, I apologize to Neil Raiden and everybody who had to deal with us finding uh, and unmuting people. But we hope you got a lot out of today's conversation. Look for those additional pieces of research on Wikibon that pertain to the specific predictions on each of these different things that we're talking about. And uh, by all means, support at siliconangle.freshdesk.com if you have an additional question, but we will follow up with as many as we can from the significant list that's starting to queue up. So thank you very much. This closes out our webinar. We appreciate your time. We look forward to working with you more in 2018.